Hello, everyone who is joining us online today. Uh, my name is Desmond Martin. I am the program coordinator for Next Wave STEM, and we are so glad to have you with us. Uh, this is uh, another one of our webinars in our ongoing uh, summer webinar series, uh, The Creative Process of STEAM Using Computer Aided Design. I'm really excited because we're going to get a chance to talk about how we can integrate arts into what our students are doing even at distance. Um, we have seen more and more in the past few years uh, that that A part of the acronym has crept in when we think about STEM um, and is really transforming our understanding into STEAM as well. Um, thinking more and more about ways in which our students aren't just going to be using um, their mathematics and their science and their technological skills to solve problems, but also um, how they can speak about their emotions, how they can communicate messages that are political, um, how they can share messages that really change the way in which we feel. Um, it's really amazing to see that shift take place because there's a um, this connection between the realization of the fact that human expression is also a story about the way we learn and more about the technologies that we create and what we can do with those technologies. Um, but uh, we won't get super meta. Um, what we'll have the chance to do today is to talk about things um, that you can do in online, free, openly available um, CAD software. Uh, we'll be using Tinkercad today. I'll be spending quite a bit of time in there um, to talk about what our students can do with respect to art. And um, from there, We'll focus on some other things we can do as well. But before I get too far ahead of myself, um, the first thing I want to do is introduce uh, who we are at Next Wave STEM. Um, but even before I do that, I'm going to give us our ground rules for today. Um, we are in a webinar mode. Um, that means that uh, while we love your faces, um, we won't be seeing you today. You don't have to worry about being recorded. Um, in that same vein, we know that you as educators are also homeschooling or working with your partners at home as well. And that means that uh, we're not always in the most quiet of environments. Uh, my wife is in our office having a good time right now. Uh, so you may hear her getting picked up a little bit. But with that being said, our microphones are also going to be closed. Um, but as I mentioned to some of our participants a little bit earlier, that means that you aren't voiceless. Uh, the chat functionality is open, so is the Q&A functionality. Uh, that means that if you have any questions or comments during the course of the webinar, that you will be able to drop it in the chat or in the Q&A, and those uh, questions and comments will be addressed on air. If there is a question or comment that uh, you ask and we can't get to it on the air, don't worry. Um, we will follow up with you from the information you provided in the registration and make sure we get you an answer. Uh, staying with ground rules for our educators who are from Illinois, this is an ISB certified professional development hour. Um, at the conclusion of the webinar today, uh, before the end of the business day, you will be receiving an automated email and that email will include a copy of the slide deck used for today's presentation, a link to the recording of today's webinar, and the certificate for you to turn into ISB to receive those credit hours. Um, for those of us who are joining from outside of Illinois, um, we are so sorry that we do not have those processes built yet to certify you for PD hours, but that is something that we are working on for some of our other states as well. Um, and of course, if at any time you have any questions, you can feel, feel free to email me. Um, my email is really simple. It's desmond at nextwavestem.com. I'm actually dropping it in the chat right now. So now that we got the rules out of the way, let's press forward and a great place to begin is at the beginning. Um, sharing a little bit more about who we are at Next Wave STEM and what we do. Um, and to put it really, really simply, we believe in you as teachers. Um, we believe in your ability to empower our students with emerging technologies 
so that they will go on and solve some of the world's biggest problems. Um, and there's kind of a big problem in the world right now, the elephant in the room, the reason why uh, we've been remote and focused on distance learning for the past couple of months is of course COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, but even before COVID-19, there were huge problems. Problems here in the United States with access to um, infrastructure, whether that's high speed or transit, problems of potable water, um, many places in the world, and depending on where you live here in the United States, because of lead service lines, um, it's clean drinking water may be a concern. Um, global warming is ever looming. That was a very interesting subtext so that they were doing there in Game of Thrones for a little while. But um, that's a real concern, that climate change is here, that it's real, and it's creating climate refugees in the United States right now. Um, and the list goes on and on. Um, we at Next Wave Sim believe deeply in the ability for our students to be those problem solvers. But what they need is access. They need access, they need exposure. Um, they need to progress and learn these really critical skills in ways in which they feel like they belong natively in the space. Um, and we know that can be a challenge. Um, so we try to simplify that. We have been writing curricula on them emerging technologies, robotics, drones, 3D printing, and computers and AI um, for teachers for K through 12, so that you all are in part with what you need. Um, training, curricula, equipment. We try to make it easy for you to create the next generation of problem solvers, uh, because I very much would like to have a long and prosperous life. And <laughs> some of you might have caught that. And I do think, and I think you think, that our students are some of the keys to making that happen. So in today's webinar, um, we've got three particular goals and um, we're gonna really get a chance to explore these goals through the perspective of computer-aided design. Um, the first thing we're gonna be talking about is how students can use the skills that they build in computer-aided design um, with respect to digital arts. Um, and that might seem a little bit scary, might seem a little bit inaccessible. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Tinkercad, um, you'll see that, or you may already know that it's not as inaccessible as it might sound. Um, for those of you who are completely new to CAD or digital design um, at all, you'll see that it's really much easier than it may sound. Um, from there, we'll pivot a little bit and talk about the actual applications um, beyond only 3D printing. Um, we think about 3D printing and additive manufacturing um, as prototyping, uh, as something that's going to change technology in lots of ways, but it doesn't only apply to the sciences and mathematics. Um, those are tools that we use to create in a lot of different contexts. And from there, we'll talk about the kind of tools um, that your students can have access to, even now, to grow in their digital design skills, and then their art business skills, and even in construction through vi various media. Um, that's something that we're really excited to do. Um, already, somebody's dropped in a question. Um, even from North Carolina, will I be able to get a certificate of attendance? Uh, yes. Um, there is a form um, that has our um, Illinois approved uh, provider number on there. All you have to do is fill in your information. Um, you may be able to translate that over into your particular situation. I'm not sure about it, but um, let me know on the back end. Email me if there's a way for me to be of assistance, if I need to fill out some forms and we can make that happen for you. Great question. And that goes for anybody. Um, if there are ways in which I can help smooth out your accreditation, if that's something that's possible, reach out to me and we'll try to get that done. So with all of that being said, we'll dig right in. And we need to consider art skills with Tinkercad. Now, before I jump right into the program, I think it's really useful for those of us who are cross-disciplinary or for even my own benefit in preparing for today's webinar to think about art education in the United States, where it stands, what it is, why we do it. Um, 
And even thinking about why we're seeing it integrated more and more with STEAM such that we are having a new acronym we get to work with. Um, and so the really amazing thing about art that is different than a lot of the things that human beings construct, um, the definition for art is very, very fluid. Um, we argue with it, we debate it. There's art philosophers with PhDs from various countries all over the world who still struggle to um, give you a concrete definition of what art is. It's um, very similar in that way to life. Um, very difficult for anyone to agree on what it means to be alive. And in a lot of situations, it's very difficult for us to agree on what does it mean for something to be art. Um, but the closest uh, consensus that I could find in terms of a definition for what art is, is that it's about human expression and emotion, um, where prose is really designed to, to give us some information. And we could do different things with that information. We can go find food or shelter or organize our systems of government or transmit skills in math and science and engineering. Um, or just know more about how our families are feeling or how our communities are doing. Um, art is different because that expression is inherently designed to make us feel something. And it's designed to make us feel something in ways that aren't expressed either linguistically in the way that we speak to each other or in the way that we write, how we share symbols that communicate meaning um, in written structures. Uh, and even that part of the definition is a little fuzzy because um, when we think about written symbols, those some people consider to be inherently artistic. So our students, on top of learning how to um, communicate facts and learn about what's going on around them and use those, get those pragmatic and useful, fulfilling our basic human needs things done in their education, um, they're also learning in art how to express emotionally through various media. Um, and in research, um, the classical media were really broken into three specific art forms. Um, there were sculpture, there were architecture, and there were painting. Um, the oldest human art that we've been able to find come in the form of cave paintings. Um, and the amazing thing is that those paintings um, were very expressive of human life. They showed all kinds of animals in the hunting scenes. Um, they showed figures of people. Um, but it was really interesting to see and read and learn that those cave paintings did not include portraits. You never got a close up on someone's face. But what you did get, and this is all over the world in cave paintings, are an example of what we see in the picture on the screen. Um, hands, people's hands pressed up against the rock and paint um, pressed and sprayed, blown through an actual pipe, maybe a hollowed out bone, um, blown onto the art, onto the wall. Um, it's debated about what these were for whether they signatures, where they're way of saying we were here. Um, we don't know. But what we do know is that this is a really simple act that we might have done as children ourselves, just tracing out our hands. It's something that's been done for years and years and years. It's it's a it's a expression, an emotional expression of our humanity. But the interesting thing about that expression is that it's two dimensional. Um, painting, drawing, portraiture, um, photography, even now, um, two-dimensional expression. And in a lot of sense, filmmaking falls into that category as well. Um, however, that's leading out a whole world of art, um, the majority of the world of art, um, which is three-dimensional. Um, people have been building and making uh, adornments and doing amazing things in sculpture, representing people and life in myth and mythology, um, representing religious expression. And because we live in a three-dimensional world, 
Um, it makes sense that we would express emotionally in a three-dimensional world. So whether it's carving from a piece of wood or throwing a piece of clay onto a potter's wheel, or if it's welding and creating a statue, or if it's glass blowing, um, all of these different media are actually three-dimensional. And it makes perfect sense then that as our students are continuing to learn and as we're progressing technologically, doing things digitally, that our students will also be creating art in three dimensions digitally. And that's really what computer-aided design allows us to do, is to take three-dimensional space and convert that into numbers that our students are in code, that our students are able to manipulate and design things that they can never do in media in the real world. But then when we pair that with 3D printing, with additive manufacturing, we can actually construct forms that would have previously been impossible for us to construct. Um, it's a really exciting time and there are things that your students can make right now that um, have never seen before in the whole history of art um, through the benefit of computer code. Um, super, super exciting, kind of meta, uh, but there are some <laughs> great places to get started. So for the benefit of today's webinar, we're really going to be focused in Tinkercad. Uh, Tinkercad is a free, free, completely free, a platform for digital um, art and computer-aided design. Um, it is a platform that you can connect to Google Classroom or set up your own classes natively in Tinkercad so that you can manage your students and the kind of art that they are creating. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch away from this slideshow and pull up Tinkercad because we're going to look at what it actually looks like to work with artistic expression. Give some tangible examples of what you and your students can build in Tinkercad and to things that are going to be especially exciting when we think about what they can physically produce. So I'm going to switch my screen over now. So this is a Tinkercad design space. I've signed in to Tinkercad. I've had an account for a while and I've signed in. I'm actually going to back up a little bit and show you the dashboard. Um, anytime a student signs in to Tinkercad, um, it is an opportunity for them to explore and create something new. Either a new design, um, my dashboard has some of the designs that I've already created. It also includes this particular page here um, for where I'm going to be designing for the webinar today. Um, it's also an opportunity for them to explore other um, creators' designs as well. But I will reel that in for now because we're going to come back to exploring other designs. Um, when I'm inside of Tinkercad and I click on that button, create new design, um, I will be entered into a brand new design space. And this is going to be empty design space. It's going, that's in itself kind of exciting because our students have the opportunity to let their imaginations just run wild. So as a really, really simple primer into the way Tinkercad works, um, Tinkercad is not about drawing lines or curves, the traditional drafting software that we think of using, um, 3D aided design, computer aided design, um, at first was really thought to be um, taking what human beings did and drafting their tool skills using markers or pens or pencils um, and translating that into a 3D world, um, that still dominates. But what we see in Tinkercad is really a more drag and drop and positive and negative space um, being used to construct objects. So in Tinkercad, what I would do is I would take an object, that objects that are classified, and I can grab something like this box and pull it into the design space. And when I pull this box into the design space, um, I have this box on the right that's called an inspector. Um, depending on the three-dimensional figure I've pulled out here, I can make changes to 
the figure. I'll even go much larger here. Let's go for 100. Or I can manipulate the figure itself by clicking and dragging on any of these touch points in real time to readjust the width and depth of my box, to adjust the height of my box in another dimension, and to rotate my box in three dimensions as well. And just like I can rotate and adjust and shape my box in multiple dimensions, I'm going to actually get rid of this shapes panel so we have a little bit more space to see. I can also rotate my view in three dimensions. That means that I can grab this view cube up on the corner and rotate around and see what I've done and what I am doing. Uh, we got another really good question here. Um, James asks, can Tinkercad be used on Chromebooks without a direct install like regular CAD? Is it web-based and all students have computers to install programs on? James, great question. The answer is it is completely web-based and cloud-based. Um, there is no installation process at all for Tinkercad. So if students navigate to tinkercad.com and create an account with a class code, um, that's something that we covered in our previous webinar. Um, that is an option for any of your students who have a device and stable internet connection. Um, one thing I will say as well, and I forgot this tidbit, um, the link that you'll receive today for the copy of today's webinar will also allow you to access our webinar series. So any content that you missed from previous Next Wave STEM webinars, you can go back and peruse and learn more about 3D printing design or robotics or um, um, drone flying, um, check us out at, uh, in that email following the uh, webinar today. Really good, great question. So as I'm working with an object, and I'm actually going to delete this one and bring a new object out here into our design space, uh, this time I will grab a cylinder. One thing that's, another thing that's really important to know is that designing in Tinkercad is about positive and negative space. So just like I can pull out a cylinder that is a positively spaced cylinder, it's a solid thing. I can also grab another cylinder. And in the inspector, I have two options. I have solid and I have a hole. And I can create a negative space. Now, why would I want to create a negative space? Well, if I take, for some of our math-minded people, if I take a positive three-dimensional space and I join it with another three-dimensional space or a negative three-dimensional space, I've kind of changed the figure that I have. So I can actually have these two objects come and intersect with each other. I can grab this cylinder, they're running into each other overlapping. And using the design tools baked into Tinkercad, I'm going to select both objects, dragging, and group. Grouping is going to be critical for your students. Grouping and ungrouping will allow them to cut holes or to join solid pieces together to make more and more complex objects inside of Tinkercad. And when they cut these holes, they can, of course, adjust the objects that they've created. So if I want to create this particular um, uh, crescent moon shape, I can uh, accomplish that through cutting and combining solid and uh, negative hole-shaped objects. And that goes with any object in Tinkercad where I can pull something out. And in this case, I'll adjust this object. So now I might have a sphere that is attached by grouping these two objects. 
So this is a really non-standard object, but I've created it very, very simply. So fine, great, good, Desmond. Um, you show me something that you might consider a little cool, but what does this mean for my students' artistic ability? Uh, well, let's explore an example of a simple shape, um, something that is actually a little bit more freehand um, that our students can do as an introductory project into Tinkerhead, and that is their own simple self-expression. Um, when our ancestors were um, making those pictures of their hands in the cave, a lot of scientists, a lot of art historians, a lot of anthropologists um, believed that was their way of letting people know they were there. Um, today, we have our own signatures, and Tinkercad is a great place to design a 3D signature. Um, we, and we can do this with this really awesome shape down here called Scribble. When I grab the Scribble and pull it out into Tinkercad, things are going to get changed up. I'm brought into a new kind of view and inspector. And the reason that's happened is because I can actually drag and scribble out a shape. And that shape will be created in three dimensions. In this case, a preview of what that shape would look like. And that becomes something else that I can manipulate in Tinkercad. So I can three, I can freehand scribble a shape. Um, in this case, I might want to do also a quick uh, tick tack toe space. I know it kind of looks a little bit like graffiti so far, but what we see is what I'm doing in two dimensional being transferred in a three dimensional space. So what I actually want to do now is I want to delete what I've done so far. I want to get rid of all of that. I'll do a little better job of getting rid of everything. We can see we can actually uh, negatively scribble as well. And I've got a little bit of an area left here. So let's get rid of that as well. So I've got empty space. Um, our students, as they're learning to draw, if they've got a touch screen, they can touch their screen and draw. If they have um, just the traditional touchpad or mouse, they can draw as well. Um, I might scribble a version of my signature into Tinkercad. And when I click done, I've created freehand this three-dimensional shape that's never existed any place else and may not exist any place else. Well, that's all fine and good. How does that become tangible and something useful for me in my classroom? Well, it is a 3D signature. And for our students who are printing things and maybe printing things in a full class, uh, 25 to 30 or maybe some more students, it may be useful if they're printing objects that are similar that they can tell them apart. So through the magic of grouping and ungrouping, we now have the ability to really know definitively what our object is um, without getting too deep into the logistics of 3D printing we can print multiple objects, completely different objects off of the 3D printer at one time. Um, for those of us um, who've heard of hobbyists with 3D printers, 3D printing um, personal protective equipment, face shields and um, respirators, um, that's really only possible because they can do a dozen face shields or half a dozen respirators on a 3D printer at one time. Um, that's part of the manufacturing process, um, but that doesn't have to be so. If a student has created a sculpture or 12 students have created a sculpture, there's nothing that says that those sculptures don't get printed out at the same time. They're gonna all be different, but we wanna give our students the ability to tell some things apart. So I'm going, actually gonna zoom out on my little scribble signature. And let's say my sculpture is just a perfect box, um, perfect 90 degree angles. Um, what I could do first is resize that box. So I want to make sure that my design is what I want it to be. And as I mentioned before, um, this scribble, this signature, I'm going to zoom in on it a little bit. I can move it around and adjust it as much as I want. And zoom out a little bit. And I can change its height as well. So I'm going to click on this carrot and pull my signature up. And now it's bursting forth from 
my object. If I were to 3D print this object right now, and I have a box with a signature that's popping out the top of it. It's been uh, stamped on there. And this is an easy way to create an actual physical stamp that your students might use. Um, but what I might also want to do is actually group these objects. And when this comes off of the 3D printer, I know exactly that this box is my box. Now, I'm going to go a little bit backwards and I'm going to ungroup the object because in the same way that I could have my signature popping out from an object, I can emboss and I can cut a signature or any shape into an object as well by changing it into a hole, creating negative space. And when I group a solid with a negative using that group tool, now I've got a valley that's been carved into my box. Um, just like a sculptor would chisel their name into their work, your students can uh, virtually chisel their names into the work that they are doing as well. So we just put a couple of basic shapes here and we are already seeing some customization of what your students can 3D print. Now, that's one example of a really easy, quick win. Um, something that you as an educator can do with your students. Um, there are other basic examples in Tinkercad's learning, um, learning functionality that I'll show a little bit later. Um, but something I'm a huge fan of is vexillology. Um, I stumbled over that word, so I'll say it again, vexillology. Um, vexillology is the study of maps. Well, not maps. Um, it's the study of flags. Um, <laughs> and I'm based in Chicago. Uh, Next Wave STEM, we are a Chicago bread company. And um, Chicago has a really particular map. Um, it's one that's considered by the American Vexillological Society uh, to be one of the best examples of a map. Um, they say it's a really good example of a map because it's got a minimal number of colors, two or three different colors. Um, you can read it easily. Um, from a distance from 90 feet of away, so there's not little letters and little words on there that you wouldn't be able to read. Um, you can tell what map it is or what flag it is, um, if it's flying or it's left to right or right to left. And it works really well if you can easily draw it in a very small space, say one inch by three inches. Um, it's a really simple design that you could build with basic tools here in Tinkercad. So if I scroll down my list of basic shapes, um, I can pull out a star. Uh, the map of, or the flag, I keep saying map. Uh, the flag of Chicago, um, I could actually describe it to you. It's a white flag. It's got four red stars in the middle of that flag. Those stars are six pointed stars. Um, running horizontally and above and below those four stars are horizontal stripes of blue. Um, so if I were to design an example of this flag for those of our students who may be Chicago based or maybe you have a really cool flag that's easy to design um, where you're from, um, I wouldn't suggest California, that bear looks like it would be a little tough. Um, this star, well, we already know for a fact that that's not going to work as a five-pointed star, but our inspector allows us to change some things, like the number of points in the shape. So I can change that easily to a six-pointed star. But if you're like me and you Google the flag of the city of Chicago, you can tell right away that that star is in the wrong orientation for a flag of Chicago. I need to change the orientation. So what I would do is rotate this star. I'm going to rotate the star by 30 degrees. Now we're looking the way we want to look in terms of the orientation. Now the easy, another easy thing to work with in students in Tinkercad is the fact that um, we can copy and paste shapes really well. And this is actually a common feature in many computer-aided design software. I can select the shape, hit Control C and Control V, and have another shape. Um, using my arrow keys, I can easily move my shapes left and right to get the kind of spacing that I'd like to see. 
And so I'll zoom in on my shapes that I have here. And I can copy and paste multiple shapes at the same time as well. So selecting two stars, I can copy those and paste those. And this time, as I zoom out, I'm going to use my arrow key to bump those over the other way as well. So now I've got four stars. Um, their spacing is probably not perfect, but that's okay for the purpose of this demonstration. Um, these four stars, I can select and change their color to no longer be that uh, light blue. I'll use that color a little bit long, but I want those stars to be red. Now, using other basic shapes that we talked about before, oh, what shape is a flag? It's a rectangle. And a rectangle in three dimensions is a box, a rectangular pyramid. So I'm going to grab a box. I'm going to adjust how big my box is in terms of length and depth. I'm going to adjust my view so I can see a little bit better. And now I can decrease the height of this box so that my stars appear right out of it and change the color of this box. I've just taken a box and made it nice and big and then flattened it down so that my stars poke at the top. And I'll change the color of this box to the white field of the flag. So now I've got something that kind of looks like the Chicago flag, but I'm missing two design elements and those are my blue stripes. And to achieve those elements, I'm going to take a couple of other boxes and throw that one down there. I'm going to create a longer box. This will serve as one stripe. I'm going to change the view a little bit so I can see what I'm doing a little bit better, get a better sense of proportion. And now I'm going to change the color of this eventual stripe to the blue. And I'm going to adjust the height of that stripe. So I'm going to pull that stripe down to something in this case that's still going to be above that blue field in the background. And just like before, I can copy and paste and adjust the position of the stripe. So I'll quick control C, then control V. My stripe goes a little bit further down than I want. I'll bring it back and then I'll adjust it down here. And in a couple of minutes, your students have modeled a flag that they might see every day, um, or they might even design their own three dimensional flag. And for good measure, you could go ahead and have them sign it at the very end using a scribble. In this case, we'll cut it into the flag. With a group. So just that easily, our students will have designed their own personal flags. Really, really basic examples of what we can do in Tinkercad using art and expression. And the amazing thing is that we can also open up our own ability to learn these tools. What I've done so far might seem complicated, but there's nothing in here that's out of your ability as an educator or from your students' ability as, as learners um, if they learn the tool. So how do I learn the tool? Tinkercad makes that easy for us. And so does Next Wave STEM. Next Wave STEM provides pr curricula in 3D printing that teaches you the tool and teaches students the tool as well. But you always need the opportunity to freshen up on your own abilities in any, any new tool. So in this case, you would navigate back to your Tinkercad dashboard by clicking on the Tinkercad button. And if you click on the menu item that says learn, Tinkercad has baked in for you lessons, starters so that you learn how to do basic things, larger lessons so that you can get a sense of how to make some more complex objects, say a ruler, a ruler that you can customize. So maybe instead of it just doing straight centimeters, you're doing um, 
uh, irrational numbers or pi or a logarithm base two or any other nerdy number that you would want to put on a very nerdy ruler. Uh, things like luggage tags or something as simple as a keychain. Lessons build up your ability to do that. And projects takes things to the next level with uh, recorded videos that will kind of take you to, to some very, very intense, very hands-on engineering design and architectural design abilities, all in Tinkercad without you ever having to draw and drag a line. Um, it's a really powerful tool for your students' uh, artistic expression. So I'm actually going to go back to our slideshow. Um, this is the really sharp tool that your students are able to use to um, build something that they might not have ever been um, able to imagine that they could build. So which skills will be able to transfer? Um, what are our students learning in Tinkercad that will pull them and set them up for the ability to do some things later on in different skills and different career sets that might be outside of what we would think of as traditional hard sciences. Anything, and I literally mean anything that takes some kind of artistic design, especially in the product and industrial design space, is ripe for students who have learned three-dimensional design. I am a native of Detroit. And that means that um, for the majority of the 20th century, Detroit, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, um, major urban centers have been driving the way the objects that we use every day look. Um, this picture is an example of an entire car that was 3D printed and showcased in Detroit. Um, but each and every day, artists are doing digital design to um, sketch an automotive application, kitchen, homeware, hardware, appliances, tools, refrigerators, sinks, toilets, vanities, um, lighting designs, lamps. Look at some of the very interesting, I'll be generous and say interesting lamp designs from Ikea. Um, electronics, the computer that you're watching me on right now. Um, the cell phones and tablets and computers that your students are using, data systems, um, aeronautics, planes just don't need to fly. They also want to have their planes look good too, whether that's Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, um, Sikorsky, if you're thinking about helicopters, or um, just yesterday, SpaceX has a fantastic looking rocket that did not launch, and that launch is rescheduled for Saturday but it just doesn't need to work. We also want it to look good. And if it's not just about looking good, we want it to convey a message. And those things are not just flat pictures. They're not just the portraits. They're not just our, um, our digital design that we might imagine with virtual effects in movies or television shows. They're 3D objects, the tangible things we use every day. Students learning 3D design and 3D printing get the skill set to be able to take the next step into a more advanced 3D design software, something like Fusion 360 or Inventor or SketchUp that allows them to, to design, tangibly design things that could be used every single day. Um, but the amazing thing is that because of the nature of three-dimensional design and really taking a physical object and being able to express that mathematically, we can also reproduce artifacts. Um, one thing I didn't show, and because of our lack of time, I won't show in this webinar today, um, is the ability to 3D scan and import an object into a design space, even into Tinkercad. And I'm going to renege on what I just said because it's so cool, I've got to show it off. Um, in Tinkercad, if you get into a design space, and I'm going to split my screen over and show this really quickly. If you get into a design space, we'll go back into the flag I was just working on. So I'll click on this button that says Tinker This. Um, that's the other awesome thing about Tinkercad. It automatically saves, so your student's computer could completely crash and die. And, and as long as they can log back into their account, 
um, they'd have their artwork saved. Um, inside of Tinkercad, I'm actually just going to select this entire design and delete this entire design. Um, there is a whole category of shapes from our menu from the Smithsonian. These are objects from the Smithsonian collection in Washington, Washington DC that have been 3D scanned and imported into Tinkercad. This is a really powerful experience and opportunity for our students right now, especially because lots of them can't travel and the Smithsonian Institution is not open at all right now. So things like this actual fossil uh, of a Triceratops that was collected by the Smithsonian and then digitally scanned becomes something that they can import, explore in digital space or 3D print their own copy of. And there are a few more objects and items there, but it's not just limited to institutions of higher learning, those that have um, thousands upon thousands or millions of dollars of resources. There are 3D scanning apps available for your students right now that are also free, that will allow them to scan objects and load them and change them and work with them inside of a design software like Tinkercad. So I had to show that because that's just so cool. Um, Tinkercad becomes the opportunity and CAD design in general becomes the opportunity to take objects that we might never be able to see and get to and get intimate with them, touch them, see how they might actually exist in their context. Think about how we might redesign and make something even better over time. So what we want to do also at Next Wave STEM is connect you to open resources, um, thinking about ways for you to continue to empower your students who might not be able to come into your computer lab, might not be able to get onto your computer. If they have access to computers, they have also have the ability to access other 3D designs. They don't have to make everything themselves. They can go somewhere and download something. Um, Tinkercad has its own gallery. So things that students who have chosen to share to make online or designers who have chosen to make online, you can actually click on the gallery tab in Tinkercad and see hundreds of thousands of different files that have been uploaded that your students can tinker with or maybe include in their own designs. Um, but other libraries like Thingiverse, My Mini Factory, Instructables, they're there for your students to explore um, and get things that are just for their artistic benefit that makes them feel things and express themselves, but also for real world uses. You can go online right now and for free download a file to print out a face mask to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, it's all out there for our taking. And of course, we have to think about, okay, my students are designing, they're working with the files, but great, so what? Um, if they don't have their own 3D printer, they'll never get their object. And to that I say, oh, contraire. Um, just like we know it's difficult to get hands on with that technology, we also know that there's a whole community of creators that's seen that problem as well. So you can actually, straight from Tinkercad, um, I'll share my screen one more time. You can actually, from Tinkercad, um, have an object printed and mailed either to yourself or to the student who's purchasing um, with export. I get some options to download the file for 3D printing, depending on what kind of printer that I have, or I could print, I could click on the 3D print function, the option here, and go to a, an actual print website. It's going to prepare my design, and then it's going to shoot me over to the website. So we'll open that new tab for printer thing. And right there, we already have our um, actual estimation, not even estimation, we actually have a price point, um, depending on how big this object is and certain settings, uh, how much material that you're going to use to fill in. Um, you can select different colors of actual materials. Um, we get an option to have the object printed. Um, to pay for the printer setup for whatever printer this particular company is going to use, and then the shipping. 
you get our triceratops head or whatever object I might have designed myself, um, print it and deliver. Um, that's something that's, that's a couple of years ago wasn't even an option and something that brings the 3D printing experience directly into our students' hands um, becomes a really, really powerful opportunity for our students as well. So how can Next Wave STEM help you all explicitly? Help well, in a couple of different ways. Um, the first is what you're doing right now. Um, our PDs are going throughout the course of the summer. Um, we have PD scheduled up until July 2nd because we know that very next weekend is a holiday weekend. And for the foreseeable future, we will continue the PDs because we know that you require help. Um, and we know that we have a resource available to you. Um, so share these with your colleagues. Um, one thing I will also say is that Next Wave STEM, as I mentioned before, is making the curricula available to you and has offerings that will help both schools and parents. Um, we can do hands-on instruction. Next Wave STEM has a stable of certified STEM instructors um, that can conduct classes with your students in school or out of school. And they can do that hands-on or completely online. Um, what do you mean hands-on, Desmond? Social distancing, you can't get hands-on with the kids. Um, we can if we can get them the equipment. Uh, those hands-on options means that we would ship your student a 3D printer or a drone or a robot and have those classes conducted with them. And if the resources aren't there or the desire isn't there, if that's just not the right fit for you, um, we can do a complete online experience using our digital tools, in this case, Tinkercad, to get you right up to that point where the student will come in to the library or to the school, wherever there's a 3D printer, and go on the next step. Um, something I'm also um, sharing with everyone on the call today is that because you're in this webinar, we're doing a special discount. So if you're interested in purchasing curricula, um, the training for the curricula, our training that allows you to actually deliver the curricula with fidelity and successfully, and also the equipment bundles for your classroom. Um, we're doing a special discount. Um, reach out to our school partnerships manager at hello at nextwaystem.com, and we will make sure that we get you more information so that you can redeem that special offer. Um, and more than anything, we want to make sure that you have something that's going to be good for when you do eventually transition back into in-person instruction. Um, our programs are designed from the outset with the idea of live instruction in mind. We just didn't appear in the midst of a global pandemic and say, hey, let's, let's do teaching online because you have to. We understand that um, your goal, your role in empowering your students through the instruction is to do just that, empower them. Um, so when you're in the classroom, uh, we want to give you resources, curricula that allows you to get to those goals with your students. So I want to pause for a second. I know I said a whole lot, kind of hit you with a fire hose of information with respect to Tinkercad and things that you can do um, with artistic skills with your students. Uh, I want to take a little moment to shut up, for lack of a better word, and ask if there are any questions about anything, about Tinkercad, about Next Wave STEM programs, about art education in the digital des design space in general. Um, what are your questions? And the chat and Q&A functionalities are open. Oh, another good question. Can Tinkercad do an array of stars on a path? The answer to that is yes. Um, if you're thinking about laying stars 
in such a way where they're zigzagging or even a geometrical design. Um, some of those things you can freehand or you can use some of the measurement tools that I didn't have a chance to show you um, to actually set the stars up in the perfect position that you want. You can do things like change the radius of the stars. Maybe you want really fat stars. Maybe you want really little skinny points coming out of your stars. And of course, you can change the amount of points and orientation of your stars. Um, the shorthand answer to your question is that if you can imagine it, um, through changing the actual parameters of the shape and through um, joining and subtracting shapes, you can design it on Tinkercad. All it takes is a clever mind. And we know our students have those. Great question. Are there any other great questions? or just any questions at all. I like questions. <laughs> oh, can Tinkercad import files from other sources to modify? The answer is absolutely. Uh, the standard, and by standard, I mean most used, vastly most used file format for 3D files is called STL, stands for Stereo Lithography. Uh, Tinkercad can save in this file format and Tinkercad can import files of that format as well. So that means that if you have someone um, design a file as an STL in uh, SketchUp, SketchUp can also design STL files and they take that file and you want to upload that file into Tinkercad, it absolutely works. Um, that is not the kind of thing that's proprietary. Um, it is an open file format. So taking a chat becomes really powerful that way. A really good question. Oh, we had a question just come in on the Q&A platform. Uh, the password be installed for each student or use the same password in general. So just got a question about passwords for students as they're creating classes. Um, for Tinkercad. Um, it's a two-step process. Um, when you as an educator sign up for Tinkercad, you have the ability to create a new class. When you create the new class, there are two ways that your students can end up in your class. Um, when they create their account, you would share with them a class code. That class code is something that they type in to their account and it places them directly in your class so that way they can share your work with you. They're kind of sandboxed off. You can see what's going on. Um, you can also um, generate a custom link for your class. So let's say you're working with your class um, and you put in the link for your class into Google chat or into your Zoom chat or just email it to your students. They click on that link and they're automatically in your class as well. Um, the other thing to know is that for our schools using Google Classroom, if your students sign into Tinkercad using their email, their school email that's associated with Google Classroom, they will automatically be placed into a class that you create in Tinkercad um, as the instructor. Um, don't dig into the weeds too much, but you don't have to worry about managing individual student passwords. All they need is a class code and they'll be good to go. Great question there. Well, we have run out of time. Oh, there's one more. Uh, does Thinkercad allow more than one student to work together on a project from different computers? Excellent question. Right now, the answer is no. Um, and the reason why I say that is because we can kind of imagine um, it's different than document editing, say, in a Google Docs or Office 365 where multiple people could type, be typing, um, that's two-dimensional, right? Um, in a three-dimensional space, that becomes kind of wild to have students maybe attempting to click and pull and move the same object in different directions. Um, that kind of doesn't work for us like boom, like uh, that becomes a real struggle to try to imagine what that would look like. So currently, students can collaborate. You can share a file and view and change files, but only one at a time. 
a really, really good question. Um, if you have any other good question, um, I am Desmond at nextwavestem.com. Um, feel free to reach out to us on social media as well. Um, we are on Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, and we are so, so excited to connect with all of you. Um, but if you need to get into the weeds on any of the curricula that you'll have access to or just ask any other general questions, um, we'd more, be more than happy to speak with you. Our next webinar is Tuesday, June 2nd, um, How to Teach Drones Remotely. Um, we're really, really looking forward to having you there, Cynthia. I'm looking forward to seeing you in that next webinar as well. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, and we look forward to speaking with you all soon. Um, stay safe and have a great rest of the day.